in the 1968 Democratic Convention, Mayor Richard Daley, defending the actions of his local police, stated, Get this thing straight once for all. The police are not here to create disorder. The police are here to preserve disorder. I no sooner than he said it, after hearing the laughs in the crowd, he realized that he confusedly stated the wrong thing. Instead of saying prevent disorder, he said preserve disorder. Kind of like last week when I kept saying Samuel instead of Samson. I know that you caught that. I don't know how many times I was afraid to go back and listen to it. I was a little confused in the names. I think the next time I preach through Judges and preach on Samson, I'm just going to call him Sammy. Uh, It'll be easier for me to remember because I had a childhood friend named Sammy. What we're going to see in the last five chapters of Israel is that Israel during the time of the judges, was marked by confusion. They were a confused people. Please understand the last five books, chapter 17 through 21, where we are now in our study, are not written in chronological order like the rest of the 12 judges. They're actually meant to be an epilogue of the book. And what takes place in these final chapters are woven through the life of the 12 judges that we've already studied. So we get a picture of the judges, and then the last five chapters we get a picture of the people that lived during the time of those 12 judges. A summation of their confusedness and their character is founded in Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. They had the constant pull of the culture from this way, and then they had what little bit of time that they had given to God's word pull this way. And it appears in the final five chapters that the pull of culture was pulling them away more greater than the pull of God's word. As a result, we're going to learn from the testimony of three today that this confusion led the people of God to compromise, carnality, and complacency. We'll see that in the testimony of a person, a priest, and then a people. The person that we're going to look at in chapters 17 and 18 today, next week we'll finish the last three chapters with an overview of the final three chapters of Judges. But in chapters in eight, 17 and 18 today, we'll see a testimony of first, a priest. His name is Micah, and Micah is from the tribe of Ephraim. Then we're going to look at a priest from the tribe of Levi, and then we're going to look at a people, the tribe of Dan. And understand those that love linguistics. So I want to give you the Hebrew pronunciation of these words but also remind you that as we read through it, because pronunciation doesn't change the message of the book itself, I'll say them the way that we would typically say them here in the Eastern Hemisphere as Americans. But as a Hebrew, we wouldn't say Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim. We would say Ephraim. E would be the first syllable. The second syllable would be like our American word fry, like French fry. Ephraim. And then Yim, Y-I-M, Ephraim. But in America, we would typically say Ephraim. Then there's the tribe of Levi over on the western side of the world. We would hear that pronounced Levi, L-E-H, Lay, and V, V-E-E. Like our friend, Jakub and Renata's son, pronounces his name Levi. In America, we would typically say that Levi. And then there's the tribe of Dan. Looks pretty easy to pronounce, but if we're speaking as a Hebrew would speak, the letter A, as it sounds in Dan, is not in their alphabet. Like Dan, Can, or Ran, they would use the letter A like in Father, the sound in Father. It'd be more of an ah sound, so it would be Don instead of Dan. 
So if you enjoy the study of linguistics, it would be Ephraim, it would be Levi, and it would be Don. Today, I'll speak as an American in an American context. We'll call it Ephraim, Levi, and Dan. There is one more word in the text that we pronounce a little differently than the Hebrew, and that is the city of Laish. L-A-I-S-H in Hebrew is Laish. We typically would say it Laish, but it would be Laish from the Hebrew culture. Now, before we dive into the text and look at the testimony of a person, a priest, and a people who are living in a state of confusion which drives them to compromise carnality and complacency, let's go to the the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word and the testimonies that we see in them. I pray that we would learn from these testimonies and that we would not get bogged down in the land of confusion like Israel was was at this time and that we would move away from compromise to conviction and from carnality to character and from complacency to consistency and that we would live our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit For your sake and your glory. Speak to us now and change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Testimony number one we'll look at today is the testimony of a compromising person. The testimony of a compromising person. Look in chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, the book of Judges. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his brother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Pause just for a second. 1,100 shekels of silver, that's no small amount of money. I I got a hold online of an an ancient uh, calculator from the world in that day and translated into what it would be in dollars in our day, that's a little over $190,000 worth of silver that this son stole from his mother. That's a large sum of money. Notice what takes place, though, when he confesses to his mother. Then his mother said, The Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly concentrate my silver to the Lord, For my son to make an image overlaid with silver. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who used them to make an idol. And Micah put it in his house. So she gave him back what would be equivalent to about 35,000 U.S. dollars to make an idol to put in his religious shrine. Verse 5. Now this man, Micah, had a shrine and he made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as a priest. So let's look at just how compromising Micah was living. And it's obvious from the way that his mother dealt with this challenge that she was a woman of compromise as well. Confusion had set in in this family and so much so that they were compromising God's word in a number of ways. If we back into those verses, the first thing we see is that he ordained his son as a priest. This was against God's law according to Numbers chapter 3 verse 10. Only a Levite could serve as a priest. But he and his family were not from the tribe of Levi. They were from the tribe of Ephraim. Therefore, they were directly violating God's laws and putting his son in a position where, according to God's laws, he could actually be put to death. And then we see this young man actually steal from his mother. Not a small amount of money, but a large amount of money. Steal from his mother. He hears her pronouncing a curse and decides to give it back. What we do not see in the text is repentance. The son doesn't seem to be sorry about disobeying God's word and stealing from his mother. He simply, kind of like getting our hand caught in the proverbial cookie jar, does not want to get in trouble. And he hears his mother pronouncing a curse, so evading trouble 
He gives the money back and says, I took it. And look at how the mom responds. Unlike Proverbs 13, 24 teaches, how a parent should discipline their child when a child has done something wrong, discipline them not out of anger, but because the parent would love the child, she actually blesses him. And then she gives him a pretty good chunk of change back to build an altar which defies the second commandment of God where he says in Exodus chapter 31 as well as in Exodus chapter 34, do not make an idol or a graven image. Even though this particular idol he was making of God, the Bible expressly states that we are not supposed to make idols. So he is defying God's word in a number of ways as the constant pull of this pagan culture is pulling one way, God's word is losing out as it's pulling the other way and he's living in the land of compromise. How bad does it actually get? Later we'll look into chapter 18, but for a moment, understand this. In chapter 18, the Dan of tribe, as they're searching for land, they actually stop at Micah's house and they steal this idol, the ephod, which in this context is actually an idol also. If we look in biblical language, ephod can be two things depending on the context. It can be a garment, if we read back in Leviticus and Exodus, it can be a garment that the high priest wears. But if we read in this context, as well as in the context a couple of chapters before, when we looked at Gideon's life, an ephod can actually be a graven image. If you remember a few chapters ago, we saw that mighty warrior, Gideon, after defeating one of the Ike families, take the golden earrings from them, and he melted them down, and he made an ephod. And he used that ephod in a place to worship God. So here, in the context, we see that Micah has made this shrine with all of these false gods to include an ephod and an idol that he made to represent the one true God. But then Dan comes through and they steal this. And look at Micah's response, chapter 18, verse 24. Micah replies to the tribe of Dan that steal his religious shrine and all the gods. He says, you took the gods I made and my priest and went away. What else do I have? Here we see that Micah's confusion led to compromise after compromise, after compromise, which ultimately leads him spiritually bankrupt. As he's living according to the pattern of the culture, rather than the prescribed word of God, he finds himself spiritually bankrupt. It's unlikely that you and I would ever build an idol that we would carve out a graven image, either from melted silver or gold or from wood, and that we would put it in a place of our house and we would pray to, pray to it. But don't we at times make goals for our life that are devoid of God? At times, don't we give our attention, our energies, our resources, our time, don't we give those things to people and things other than God himself? The Bible would clearly teach if God is not preeminent in our life, whatever is in place of God is actually an idol and that we're compromising in what the Bible refers to as idolatry. Remember, Israel lived as if they had no king. We have a king. His name is Jesus, and we should live in light of his word. If we don't, like Micah, we'll find ourselves helpless and we'll find ourselves hopeless. Testimony number two, we see the testimony of a carnal priest. First we see Micah, who is a compromising person. Now we see a carnal priest. Look in verses 7 through 13 in Judges 17. As the story continues, it says, a young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah who had been living within the clan of Judah, left town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said. 
and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, live with me and be my father and priest and I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him and the young man became like one of his sons. Then Micah installed the Levite and the young man became his priest and lived in his house and Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. So in these verses, we continue to see how confused Micah is as he compromises and installs a priest in his home away from Shiloh where the temple of God was and the priesthood was called to live. But we also see a carnal priest, a priest that has moved away from his land and has agreed to become a rent a priest away from the temple where God had established that the priest would lead. Take notice that the young Le uh, Levite from the tribe of Levi is likely a priest. Well, what I mean by that is he is from the tribe of Levi which means being a priest is in his genes. Levi, genes. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is in his genes in the sense this. Seriously, it's, it's in his genes in this sense. Not all Levites are priests, but all priests are called to be Levites. And all priests are to serve in Bethlehem at the tabernacle in this period of time where it was located in Shiloh. According to Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 14, God made it abundantly clear that there would only be one place of worship for all of Israel. And that they were to gather in Shiloh and there the Le Levitical priests would lead that worship. However, this confused priest made a carnal decision one after another to desert the prescribed place of worship that God had already ordained to become a priest in Micah's house in the city of Ephraim, away from Shiloh. He redefined God's word, bent it just enough to suit his own selfish desires. Think about it. He had a pretty good gig. He had a year's salary promised every year, free room and board, very likely all the latest streaming services that were offered at that time, and some extra cash to pad his pockets. He was taken care of, but he was outside of the will of God. Bent the word just enough to suit his own personal desires. If we're not careful, we might be guilty of the same. And this bending God's word is as old as mankind. Think about it, Genesis chapter 3. Remember the context? It was a perfect world. God had created Adam and Eve and everything that's in the world. All the animals, the trees, the beautiful land, created everything. And there in the garden, Adam and Eve, husband and wife, man and woman, had perfect fellowship. At the moment, they knew no sin. Perfect fellowship with each other. And they had perfect fellowship with God and there was only one command twofold command but one command they had been given by God don't touch or eat from the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden now remember they had all the food and fruit they needed perfect fellowship with each other and with God and then Satan comes along the scene in the way of a serpent. And he doesn't contradict God's word in the sense to say, this is what God said and said something wrong. Instead, he throws confusion in the equation. And as a result of the confusion, because they were not living according to God's word, they made carnal decision and sin entered the world. Remember what Satan said? Did God really say? Well, it's impossible that we would really know what God says unless we first get in the Word and with His help study it, learn it, meditate on it, and as He leads us to memorize it, and then the Holy Spirit, when we're in the battle in life against Satan or His fallen forces or just the natural pull of society itself, then we know 
Because God gives it to us, what his word says, and we move from carnal decisions to decisions made by conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of his word. If we're not careful, we might fall into carnality and not live out the very character that God prescribed according to Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, the very character of Christ that we're called to live in. We're going to move from carnality to the character of Christ. We need to live recognizing that Jesus is our king. Third testimony we see as we continue to work our way through the passage is the testimony of a complacent people. A complacent people. And this is the tribe of Dan. I encourage you when you get home to read all the way through chapter 18. For sake of brevity, let me summarize the chapter. It starts out the same way we started our time together with what we read in chapter 17, verse 6. In chapter 18, verse 1, it says, Israel has no king. Then it tells the story of the tribe of Dan and how they go their own way. Instead of settling in the land that God had apportioned, the tribe of Dan went to the mountains of Ephraim to look for a land that was easier to conquer. If you want to go back and read about God apportioning the land that they refused to enter and conquer, you can find that in Joshua chapter 19, verses 40 through 46. Joshua 19, 40 through 46. Also earlier in this book, Judges chapter 1, verses 34 through 36, we see God apportioning the land for all of the 12 tribes, but we see Dan not going into the land for fear of the people that occupied the land. So now, in Judges 18, we see them searching for new land that would be easier to conquer. On their way, they meet the Levite priest and learn how Micah took him in as a personal rent-a-priest. They ask, which shows that they're a complacent people and that they too are living a very confused life because they asked this priest away from the temple of Shiloh, a personal priest, rather than as God had ordained to be the priests of the nation there in Shiloh, they asked this personal priest for wisdom and a blessing, and the priest obliged. Next, a group of Danites spot out the land of Laish, where the Sidonians live. They returned home, gave a favorable report to the entire tribe, and the leaders of the tribe, along with the people, agreed that the Sidonians would be easy to overthrow. So they start moving the entire tribe northward up into Ephraim to take over the land of the Sidonians. And on their way, the original spies talked about Micah. So the tribe stopped in the territory where Micah lived. And then they learned of the rent of priest. And they convinced the rent of priest to steal Micah's shrine, his ephod, and all of his false gods and take them into the new land of Laish that they would actually settle in. Now, some would say that perhaps because it was an entire nation instead of a family, maybe they paid him more money to go, and that's why he went. Or it could have been the 600 soldiers that stood just outside of Micah's house that actually convinced him to go. But either way, the priest went and took all of Micah's religious shrine and those false gods with him for the people of Dan. Perhaps the most complacent thing that the tribe of Dan did is what they did with the religious shrine that they stole and the priest that they took from Micah. Samuel is believed to be the writer of the book of Judges. Now, after last week, I want to clarify that Samuel, not Samson. So Samuel is believed to be the writer of the book of Judges. And Samuel writes in verses 30 and 31 something that I think as Americans we should probably play, pay special attention to today. Look at verses 30 and 31. 
There the Danites set up for themselves the idol, and Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of captivity of the land. Verse 31, they continued to use the idol Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. First, notice the complacency in verse 30. And the irony that we actually discover in verse 30. It says they set up for themselves the idol and Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, set them up as priests. Here, we find the name of the Levite that we just talked about in chapter 17 that was serving as Micah's priest. His name is Jonathan. Did you notice his lineage? He's the grandson of Moses. Do you remember Moses is the one that God gave to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt, lead them out of bondage, and then through Moses, he gives the laws of God. And just two generations later, his grandson is now a priest apart from the prescribed place that God ordained priests to lead, and now he's leading a people that are following pagan ways and worshiping false gods rather than actually teaching the people to honor God. Irony in the story. But look at what Solomon pointed out in verse 31. Not Solomon. See, I did it again. Look at what Samson. Not Samson. See, I did it again. Making sure you're paying attention. Look at what Samuel pointed out in verse 31. They continued to use the idol Micah had made. All the time, the house of God was in Shiloh. Notice that he points out that they were worshiping according their, to their own way rather than the way that God actually prescribed for them to worship. At this time in history, there was one place. It was in Shiloh, it's where the temple was. And all 12 tribes were supposed to come to the temple to worship. Today, we can worship on our own because the Holy Spirit lives within us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 teaches the moment we believe in the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up royal residence in our house, in, in, inside of us. This is his house. This is a house of worship. But we still have, according to the New Testament, a prescribed place and a prescribed pattern that on the first day of the week, we would gather and we would worship in what's called the local church. All through the New Testament, we read that the local church is to be a place that we're to be committed to. Not a building, but a people. And the people are to get together and gather. The God-inspired author in Hebrews 10.25 wrote it this way. Do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. It's indicative from that passage that the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more people will become complacent in their life and need to be reminded that we're called by God to get together regularly to worship Him and to encourage each other. Going to church each week is not a punishment. It's a privilege because God designed us in a way that we need each other. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 says it this way. Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, the other can help one up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. The gifts that you bring, the resources that you have, the smile on your face, the handshake, the hug that you bring to church with you every week just might be what somebody else needs to help them in their journey with Jesus. All of us have a ministry. And as we honor the Lord, he calls us to do it in the context of a local church. The nation of Israel at this time lived without a king and they went their own way. Today, we really have no excuse because we have a king. His name is Jesus. We don't have to live in the land of confusion because our king has given us his word. We can move from confusion to clarity. And as God gives us clarity, we can move from compromise to conviction. 
We can move from carnality to character. And we can move from complacency to consistency because his grace is enough. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your amazing grace the grace that saves and the grace that sustains. I pray daily we would submit to the king, humble ourselves before you, and receive the very power of the Holy Spirit for each day, lest we live in the land of confusion. And God, as you give us clarity, move us, please, Move us away from compromise that we would be people of conviction. Move us away from carnality that we would be people of character, the very character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And move us away from complacency that we might consistently live like Jesus. Help us, Lord, that we might do this for your sake and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.